we are now done with the pre-processing of the data and it's time to talk about dimension reduction. We won't go through the mathematical details but instead aim for the intuition of how dimensional reduction works. We want to learn how to reduce the dimensions and how to visualize our data. Why are we doing this? The next step, which is the clustering, is a bit tricky and it is more tricky if we have a lot of data with biological and technical noise and huge number of dimensions. So we want to help the clustering step a bit here. We also want to be able to visualize our data. We talk about dimensions here. By dimensions we mean that we are measuring tens of thousands of genes. You can think one gene expression value as one measurement and each measurement as a dimension. So thousands of genes measured means thousands of dimensions in our data. We want to remove redundancies in the data. The expression of many genes is correlated and we don't need all the dimensions to distinguish between the cell types. We just need the most relevant information. Also, the clustering methods can't really handle too many dimensions and your brains can't comprehend more than three dimensions in the visualization. You can try imagining a four-dimensional plot, for example. It can be a bit tricky. With less complex data, the computational time is of course also much shorter. So now, we reduce those dimensions and choose the most interesting ones for clustering. We use PCA for that. Later on, we use TSNE and UMAP for visualization. Let's take a closer look at PCA. PCA comes from the words Principal Component Analysis. In short, PCA tries to find the principal components of the data. So it's looking for the directions where the data is most spread out, so where there is most variance. The first principal component explains most of the variance in the data, the second principal component explains second most variance, and so forth. We will select the most important principal components and use them for the clustering. So let's say that instead of uh, 20,000 genes, we have maybe 10 principal components. So the dimensions of the data go from 20,000 to 10. Essentially, you can think that principal components represent a robust metagene that combines the information across correlated gene sets. Remember that before PCA, we scaled the data so that the genes have equal weight in the downstream analysis and the highly expressed genes don't dominate. Here we can see a simplified explanation of principal component analysis. This slide is by Paolo Sarnevsky and we thank him for it. Here you can see a two-dimensional data set. Each dot here is a cell and here we can see each cell's uh, expression on gene A and here on gene B. You can see that the cells so the dots here are spread in this area. So there is some variance in this direction. The principal component analysis is like rotating the data to another coordinate system. So it's choosing the directions where there is most variance in the data. In this example, this red line represents principal component 1. As you can see, there's most variance in this direction. The second principal component, shown here as blue line, and here, with these uh, measurement lines, is principal component number two. So we go from the two-dimensional representation of two genes expression into principal component one and two by rotating the coordinates to another system, as seen here. You can also see that the principal component one is explaining up to 98% of the variance. And principal component 2 is nearly insignificant, explaining only some percentage of the variance. So it can be said that principal component 1 represents these two genes very well. And PC2 can be disregarded. So in that sense, we go from two dimensions into one dimension. In real life, there are thousands of genes and maybe tens of principal components. 
We mentioned earlier that principal components can be considered as metagenes. Now it's of course of interest which are the genes present in each principal component. This can be visualized in this loading plot, which lists the top genes associated with each principal component. So which genes are important for principal component 1, you can see list here. And the correlation between the gene and the principal component can be direct, meaning positive, or reverse when it's negative. Here's another representation of the principal components. Here you can see the cells, and here you can see genes. This heat map shows you which genes are corresponding to separating the cells. Both the cells and the genes are ordered according to their PCA scores. So it's plotting the extremes of both ends of the spectrum. Here we can see principal components 1 and 2 of a data set. So again here each dot is a cell. You can capture some gene expression patterns with principal components. So principal components can separate cell types. This could be a cell type and this could be another one and so forth. Note however that PCA can also capture other things like sequencing depth or cell heterogeneity or complexity. It's not maybe the best method for visualizing your data. So that's why we use other methods for that. After the principal component analysis, we want to determine the significant principal components. It's very important to select those for the clustering step. However, it's always quite challenging to estimate the true dimensionality of a data set. We give you a few plots that you can use for this estimation, but keep in mind that the Surat developers give these instructions. So they say that you can try repeating the analysis with different number of principal components. The results often do not differ that dramatically. They also say that rather choose a higher number, but don't be too greedy. For example, choosing only five principal components can make the rest of the analysis a bit difficult. Elbow plot is one of those plots that you can use to determine the number of principal components that you want to use in the analysis. Here you can see the number of principal components. So by default we count 20 of them. And this is showing the standard deviation of the principal components. So how much variance is explained by each of these principal components. Now, how to decide which principal components to include in the analysis? Should you look for the gaps, like here? or when the curve reaches the plateau, like here. Keep in mind the instructions of the Surat developers. Looking at the heat maps is another option for determining which principal components to use in your analysis. Here you're trying to check if there's still a difference between the extremes. Here you can see clear difference, and here not so much. But where to draw the line? Maybe here? or maybe here, hard to say. You might want to do some test runs. You can also exclude principal components that are driven primarily by uninteresting genes. So if you spot, for example, cell cycle genes or ribosomal or mitochondrial genes here, that principal component might be responsible for those. Consider regressing out that kind of variation in your data. Now we have talked about principal component analysis, but like mentioned, other dimension reduction methods are used for visualization after the clustering. We are dealing with TSNE and UMAP, which are both graph-based nonlinear methods. Most of the tools, including Surat, offer PCA, TSNE, and UMAP as options for visualization. And like said, we use PCA for dimension reduction before clustering, and then TSNE and UMAP for visualization. Here you can see a simplified example why TSNE is better than PCA in some cases. These little dots here represent the data points that we want to measure the distance of. In the PCA space, which uses Euclidean distance, the distance between these two dots is very short. Now, as you can see, the dots are really connected in the spiral form. And the TSNE can figure this out, so the distance is shown like this, so then it would be the whole. 
whole loop here in the TSNE space. Without going to further details with TSNE, like I said, it's a graph-based, nonlinear and stochastic method, and it only preserves the local distances between the cells. So the distances between the groups are not meaningful, meaning that within the group the distances mean something, but whether this or this distance is long or short is not really considered. TSNE has been the gold standard in single cell RNA seq visualizations, and it can be run on top of principal components, which is how we use it. There are many parameters to optimize. Here's a simplified example of going from two dimensional data to one dimensional data using TSNE. So basically, we're looking the distances between the different dots here and here. And throughout iteration rounds, we try to make the data so that the distances, the local distances here are preserved, so they are similar as the distances here. Remember that the global distance, so the distance between the green and red group doesn't mean that much, but the distance within the group is meaningful. UMAP is another nonlinear graph-based dimension reduction method like TSNE. It's a bit newer and very efficient, so it's very fast. It also runs on top of the principal components, and it is based on topological structures in multidimensional space. So unlike TSNE, you can compute the structure once. There's no randomization step, which makes it faster, and you could in theory add data points without starting over. It also preserves the global structure better than TSNE. If you want to learn more about the basics of TSNE or UMAP, consider checking the video number six on our single cell RNA-seq playlist. Paolo Czernewski explains very nicely there the different methods.